I took what I learned there and I always knew that I would break away from this one day. I was in there for five years. They got into all kinds of stuff and it was the main guy eventually thought he was the second coming of Jesus and they laid down all these rules that people had to follow like, you know, if you grew a mustache, you're hiding your real self so nobody grew a mustache and all this top-down authority. I was right in it, but I always knew, I always knew I'd get out. All right, Michael Payton, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thank you very much, Brown. Good to meet you. Yeah, it's great to meet. We had we had a call a while back, and that was because you sent me an email. You listened to an episode of this podcast, and you sent me an email. And like in this episode, this is with Bob Burnett. I don't have the, the episode number right now, but if people look for Bob Burnett, Bitcoin for Millennials, they can find it. But you emailed me because you listened to the episode, and in this episode, Bob and I talk about if Bitcoin is a cult. I think I asked mm -hmm. Bob, you know, Bob, do you do you think we're we're in a cult? And you listened to that episode and you emailed me and you shared that you had been in a cult. You're out of it, but you're all all the way into Bitcoin. And yeah, you shared with me what your thoughts were on Bitcoin and Bitcoin being a cult. And yeah, absolutely love that. So I really wanted to to talk with you, but I also shared that email on, on X, on Twitter, and people were all over it. Like, I want to listen <laughs> to this guy's story and I'm super interested to, to, yeah, to hear his view. So, well, here we are. So I'm super excited to, to talk. Yeah, me too. I think you have a very interesting story and, uh, yeah, let, let's just get into it. I think the very first question should be, how did you get into a cult? Well, it's kind of a long story. Um, I guess uh, when I was in my early 20s, I, I rented an apartment in the second floor of a house in Toronto. And in the middle of the night, I was sleeping alone. And through my side window, I saw this big guy in the dark crawling up East Trough and trying to get into my kitchen window. So um, I, it freaked me out, this big guy. So... Um, I just snuck over to the kitchen and I figured, okay, if he's coming in the window, the best chance I have of when he's vulnerable, put his head in the window. I'm just going to smack him out again, right? But just before, just before I saw his head and just before I was going to hit him, I heard him say, my name, Mike, Mike. And it was my freaking brother. And he was, <laughs> he was crawling in the window <laughs> in the middle of the night, like one or two in the morning. And he's six foot four. So you can imagine, you know, seeing that figure outside my window. So um, he told me, um, this was before cell phones and stuff, so nobody could call me. And I don't think I had a phone at the time. Apparently, well, he just said my little brother died in a motorcycle accident, right? And they had no way of reaching me. So I was shocked. We went downstairs and my the rest of my family is by the front door. And it was devastating because he was 19, six foot five, great guy. And yeah, I remember my mother crying at the door. So we went back to the countryside and um, uh, I couldn't, I didn't know what to pray for because it was a very serious accident. I mean, he hit his head and was, was done. So I remember going in the backyard of my parents' place, looking up in the night sky, there was no moon and all the stars were out. And I, I just started to pray to God for, I didn't know what to pray for. So I just prayed for some answers as to where he was. So. The next day, I heard about this this meeting. It was uh, like an introductory course to some meeting, right? So the guy said, hey, I'm really sorry about your brother. And let's go to this meeting. Maybe it'll help you. So we, we went to this meeting. And it turned out to be the introductory course to this cult. And it was very fascinating because they did a room full of people. And they were doing these things like uh, memory pegs where they, where they show you how to uh, enhance your memory. And they were doing healing exercises where they're going into a deep meditation and apparently seeing psychically inside people, things like that, right? So I signed up. I signed up and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. No? It did turn out to be a cult. And I just want to say about cults, there's so many different variations of what people call cults. Uh, to me, a cult is just an authority taking over your, your thinking. And that could, that could apply to so many things today in this world, like people just let other people and organizations do their thinking, whether it's political, governments, you know, there's, I thought the Soviet Union, uh, communism is a giant cult. 
you know, yeah. and people people buy into it. So anyway, I went I went through the cult, and it was uh, a few years. And don't forget, I got in there for the prayer, asking yeah. where my brother was. So we did all these meditations, and there came a point where we had to do some healing. You know, go into this deep meditation and visualize somebody that we didn't know and figure out what was wrong with them. That was like a, a, a test for us. And, of course, I didn't think I could do it. So I went into this deep meditation, and what we used to do is we used to get these little cards, and we would go home and we'd write down some people that we knew that were sick, write down their age, their name, what was wrong with them, and then we'd bring them in and use them and trade them amongst each other. So I was in this deep meditation, and my friend that was guiding me, he took me down to the meditation, and I was counting down these colors and very deep into my meditation. And he described this guy, his age, where he lived, and asked me to go through his body psychically and figure out what was wrong with this guy, right? So, of course, you think, I'm just imagining all this stuff, right? So um, I went, went down, I'm going through all the different... Um, parts of his body and I can still see it from it's like all of a sudden this, this thing popped into my head and I didn't want to say anything and he my friend said uh, what is it so I'm going through all the different things like the heart things like that and I know how magic works I know you know with these double blind tests and things like that I know if you sort of suggest something you can lead somebody somewhere and mm -hmm. it should be double blind because you know even the person that's doing the, the test may not be aware that he's giving you hints but he does right but this was so random. I stopped and I saw this thing in this guy's head just in my, my mind. It was like a metal egg implanted in his skull. And I didn't want to say anything because it didn't make any sense to me. So he said, what is it? I said, oh, it's nothing. And he said, uh, well, you saw something. What is it? So I said, well, it's a metal egg in, in this guy's skull. Turned out this guy was in the war and he had a metal plate. He had an injury and had a metal plate implanted on his skull. Not, but I, I guess a piece of metal plate in his skull to replace a piece of skull, right? Mm. And I, I freaking saw it, man. So that kind of convinced me. But the, the whole cult thing, that was very valuable to me personally. So I took it upon myself to do meditation by myself. I think anything spiritual like that really is a very personal journey. Yeah, And it, it was to me. So I took what I learned there. And I always knew that I would break away from this one day. I was in there for five years, and they got into they got into all kinds of stuff. And it was uh, the main guy eventually thought he was the second coming of Jesus. And they laid down all these rules that people had to follow, like you know, if you grew a mustache, you're hiding your real self, so nobody grew a mustache and all this top down authority. But I was I was right in it. But I always knew I always knew I'd get out, but. That stuck with me, and this other workshop, I remember they um, they wanted me to, the, the whole group of us, to do a meditation and have guidance within ourselves as to where our lives were headed. And I had some visions there, and I, I shared them. I can't even repeat these things because uh, I'd, I'd cry. It's just very emotional for me to, to even bring it up. But that, to me, was very personal. And they didn't believe what I saw. And that was fine. I know I know what I saw. So eventually, um, I, I got out of it. And um, the, the way I got out of it was the head guy went down to the Cayman Islands, and he started to, to buy some land in the Cayman Islands. And he got most of his uh, staff to uh, <clears throat> invest in it. So everybody invested in it. So then I met this girl, Power of the Pussy. I met, I met this girl, <laughs> and she was outside the cult, and it was a big no-no to date anybody outside the cult. But it's one thing that's more powerful than the cult was a, was a nice-looking woman. So she was, she was really good because um, instead of uh, confronting me with the nonsense, like, how do you believe that? Why are you investing in this stupid stuff? Um, she just said, well, that's, that's really good. You're investing in the Cayman Islands. And then she just sort of asked, can you get your money out of it if you want? And I, I started to think for myself, you know, and think, well, I don't know if I can. So I really didn't know anything about this stupid investment, right? Mm -hmm. So it started to wake me up. And anyway, eventually, 
I got really angry with it, and and the whole thing the whole thing kind of collapsed after I confronted the second in command guy. Um, but I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like it was a negative thing. It was five years of hell because they kind of controlled your thoughts. But what they taught we were taught getting deep into Christianity, deep into spirituality, deep into meditation. It really it was really amazing things. Like, I mean, there's all kinds of different cults, like uh, Scientology, what they believe is mm. aliens inhabiting their body and crazy things like that. I don't want to say too much about other cults, but there were other cults out there. But in the 70s, 60s, late 60s, 70s, 80s, there were all these new age cults happening. And, and that was, uh, so I eventually, know, I eventually got out of it. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah. So yeah. my my understanding or or perspective on it, right, is 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 kind of that like a, a people look for a certain meaning or there's like a trigger event or li- a life changing event as as you experience too, right? And they yeah. they start looking for meaning and they find a place where they think they can find it. And it sounds like you, at least in the beginning, had nice experiences learning something new or you know getting in touch with the spiritual side. Like when 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 did you realize that it was a it was a cult like are there any elements where or, or things that happened or they proposed where you realized you know i'm i'm kind of getting manipulated in well basically your your you know your thinking well i like freedom freedom to me has always been really really important to me and i always knew be, because they were very authoritarian authoritarian very down on everything you did like they wanted to control everything right so I always knew I'd get out of it, but I wanted to learn as much as I could while I was there because I was learning so much about human nature, about, you know, about courage, uh, what it takes to stand up to a crowd. It's very difficult when everybody around you is saying one thing, but you want to be a rebel against that. And it, I learned a lot about human nature, uh, the crowd mentality. Um, it, I think it was very valuable to me. Yeah, But I, I don't want to get away from from why I went in there the first place was that prayer to find out where my brother went. And there, there was a time when, when I was lying alone in bed and I have to, there's no way to describe this accurately because it's two things I saw. I was lying in bed and my mother had passed away maybe a, a few months before. And I got a, I got a, I hate to say a message. I heard mm-hmm. the words, I love it here. But I can't convey to you exactly what came over me. Mm. It was like I knew everything about her. I'd never seen or felt. I can't even describe what it was. It was like I knew everything about her. I never felt anybody with such joy and freedom and happiness. And I knew everything about her. She wasn't the same woman, the same mother that I knew. She was absolutely, completely happy. Everything about her I knew 
just you know my soul knew about her just from hearing or feeling something but, but it was way better than actually talking or anything i can't describe it but yeah. honestly it's it was it was amazing and then another time with a group of people i was sitting there watching a group of people and this beautiful uh, It's hard to talk about it, really. That's okay. I'd love it to was, ask you. It was a yeah. beautiful amber light that, that covered everybody. It was in the whole room, and everybody was a part of this amber light. It was like a liquid gold, and it was in and around everybody. And the love I felt from everybody, I could see it and feel it was wrapped around me, too, and that was another experience I had. So... I think my prayers were answered. So that's how, yeah, that's how I got in. That's how I got it. And that's what I took away from it because the, the prayer was answered as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, I, I think that aligns with, with the, what I wanted to ask. Like you, you have, you look for something, you find it, or you think you find it, or you perceive you find it, right? And then, and then you stick around and then at one point, well, they start buying lands or <laughs> ask you for money. <laughs> right. And then it, it always sounds again, as an outsider, like it, there is value in a certain way or people, well, they perceive that they find value in it. So they stick around, but eventually it cults always turn into this power game eventually, or this uh, abusing of this following for certain resources, etc. How, how would you define these elements that that define a cult? Is there anything, you know, uh, of course we're going to talk about Bitcoin and people say Bitcoin is a cult. Like what is it? What is one element that would definitely define a cult? Control. Absolutely. It's all about control. Uh, people get great ideas. People have clubs, but it's just human nature to take a little bit more, you know, take a little bit more control, try and control people's feelings a little bit more. And like I say, there's there's so many different cults. Anybody that understands a cult and what I went through, it's you see it all the time. Uh, whether it's a political party, people take sides and just throw away all their their common sense and logic and just follow that. Yeah. So it's it's just basically control and people getting the leaders. It's it's just human nature too. They, they just want to take more and more control because they can. And it turns in it turns into a cult. And like yeah. I said, there's so many different variations of cults. So and what are what are some examples of 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 cults today or in history? Uh, I mean you you also wrote a book in which you also also talk about past and present elements around cultism. Like what what are some examples that that, that you see today? So today I would say I hate I hate to be political, but I see it in the a Democratic Party. You can mm. see they're against Bitcoin, of course, but the the common sense has gone out the window, um, and people are believing all kinds of silly stuff that they normally wouldn't believe. You know, just because it's their side and it's information coming down the pipe, and of course, it's because it's on their side, they're going to believe anything. Like in the Canadian government, the same way. The Trudeau government is just top-down authority, and it's the can, country's turning into a giant cult, and there's always people rebelling against it, and they're almost criminalized for doing it. Uh, so that's an example of a cult today. Uh, in the 70s, there were new, this New Age cult movement, like kids were searching, like you said, all the time, right? But now it's more um, a team sport with political parties, I'd, I would say. it's It's funny, but... One example is is Trump himself. When he when he ran, okay, you know the story of um, the emperor has no clothes. The tailors went into the emperor and convinced him that they held up this material that was invisible, that only people that are worthy could see it. Blah blah blah. So they made this beautiful clothing for him, and he went rode out on the street, and uh, he was completely naked, and they were just con men. Um, so so tr the, kid, the kid that's standing on the side of the road, right, with his mother, and says, Mommy, why isn't the emperor wearing any clothes, right? That's, cult. that's Trump. 
he's calling out all the all the bullshit out there. And I think there's there's three categories of people that I see that I see myself in, in a smaller scale. There's the people that will look at the kid and say, Wow, he's right, you know, this doesn't make any sense. You know that that little kid's right. Uh, the majority of the people have bought into the system like he's the emperor. They bought into the system. They want to prove that they're worthy. They want to fit in. They're not evil, but they they say to the kid, "Oh, you're just a silly kid." You know, poor mother. He doesn't. She doesn't know her kid's not worthy. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, they can't see it either, but they go along with it because they're invested in it. I think that's the majority of the people today, in certain parties, right? And then there's the third kind of person that is pure evil. They're the tailors. They're manufacturing it all. So I think that's three different examples of the way that they react to to Trump and that you can see it on a large scale. People will actually hate them. The closer they are and the the more invested they are in the system are not just going to criticize him. They're going to hate him because they're questioning everything he stands for. It's like when we were in the cult, we, um, we looked at everybody as an outsider that didn't really know the details and weren't really that enlightened, you know? And we'll we'll get hostile towards people that question it because they're questioning your whole being. Yeah. So that's what's uh, that's how I and point that how, out what's happening today. And how does that eventually uh, turn into behavior? Like what what is called like behaviors? Is that as you mentioned, like dismissing people that say you're in a cult or don't agree with what you're doing or. And, and, and like lash out at them or do you have any other examples? Well, you have to, you have to know the, the psychology of it, right? So say you have somebody that um, comes along and talks about Bitcoin. The people that are closest to the uh, monetary system are the ones and benefiting from it are the ones that are going to fight for that system. So they're they're That's, that's exactly what they're doing. They're fighting, fighting hard for the system. And because you're threatening their livelihood, you're threatening their 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 money, their power. Uh, they're going to hate you, and that's that's what's happening. And it's it's difficult to get them over that. What I what I really love about Bitcoin, it's not so much North American North American benefit, although it's a huge benefit for North America and the Western world. It's the rest of the world because if you look at Africa, they've been a third world country forever. And France prints a good portion of the of the uh, currencies throughout Africa, and they control the people, they control the monetary system, and the greatest benefits are going towards France and the upper echelon of, of French society and the politicians and the people that are printing the money. The whole system, the whole world is like that right now. And mm-hmm. for the first time in history, we've got this thing that came along that they can't control, they can't manipulate it, they have to get with it. And it's the sort of thing, it's, it's a win-win for everybody that adopts it. Because if, if you adopt Bitcoin, you're not only making yourself richer, you're making the rest of the people that adopt it richer. Because it's, it's taking it away. It's, it's rare. People don't understand how important it is that it's limited asset. Like nothing in history has ever been that. Anything with money has been that limited. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. While while you're talking, I'm thinking about I I tweeted a segment from another podcast that I that I published with uh, Tomer Strolight. I think I I sent to you that one too. It's about the spiritual path. Oh on, yeah, yeah, on, that on was Bitcoin. good. Yeah, and there's there's a part in there where Tomer shares, and and I'll quote from the tweet, but I think it's interesting. He says, "Bitcoin isn't like you are joining a cult and are commanded to like repeat after me, like like repeat after the leader. Like you don't emerge." as a clone of another clone member when you are a Bitcoiner, right? Like no, no Bitcoiner is the same. And then he said, you basically emerge from an existing cult and, and you, you go into, into freedom, right? All, all by yourself. And what I like about that also, but the emperor has no clothes example, right? I think the emperor has no clothes is also about like, you know, he's naked, but you still pretend he has clothes on, right? And it's, it's also, I think George Orwell says something about that 
eventually, you know, the people in charge <laughs> will lead you to deceive your own eyes, basically. And I think that's also what Tomer is talking about. Like when we talk about money, that the, the entire fiat money paradigm is also a cult. Like you are being told what this is. You are being forced to use this thing also by people who think it's a good, it's a good thing, but objectively, once you step out of it and view it from an external place, you see that it's totally not beneficial for most of the people that, that use fiat money. Right. And so I like the idea of stepping outside out, out of a cult into, into freedom when, when you adopt Bitcoin. Getting back to the cult and the reason why I was in it, it was a very spiritual journey for me. Like I had, I've had some visions that I can't even talk about. They're so profound to me, but you sort of get a, a sense of what's good in the world and everything ab about Bitcoin, all my senses, all my sense of goodness is directed towards Bitcoin. There's something very, very spiritually good about it and the way it's headed. And it's almost like it can't be stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I think there's there's a change in the world that's happening right now, and I think it's uh, inevitable. And I feel I feel very good about it. So you know, just coming from my gut feeling, and you know, my experience with a psych I hate to say psychic phenomena, but my visions, things like that that I've seen, I feel really good about uh, Bitcoin and where it's headed and what it represents it takes all through history you had to centralize money because somebody has to control the value of it you know it's like uh, b somebody has to keep them in a certain spot of gold um you know fort knox nobody knows how much money there's how much gold is actually in fort knox nobody's actually audited it you know so we, we have to take it on trust with bitcoin you don't have to trust you know it's all verified yeah and and it's not you're not creating more of it all the time so it's it's something completely different that's going to change 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 the world for the better and uh, i love it you know i i'm at a loss for words i don't i don't know what to say it, it just it blows me away could you elaborate or try <laughs> to elaborate a bit on that like what makes you say that there's such there, there's such a big spiritual element to bitcoin or either hard money or you know, the fact that Bitcoin exists as, you know, another, a parallel paradigm compared to, you know, fiat I think money. it's, I think it's a fact, the fact that it's worldwide, you know, like I, I spent a lot of time in Peru, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and they're, they're always so poor. I just got back from the Philippines this year and you see slums everywhere. People are just getting by. The first time in history, like the, the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, they print all the money and there's no value in it. It's just hoping that people believe that it's valuable. But really, they're just going further and further into debt, creating all this. And the people at the bottom of the food chain are the ones that are suffering the most. And horribly, it's a third world country and they'll never get out of it. I mean, their currency is going down. The U.S. currency is the best of the worst. I mean, mm. the best of the bad currencies, right? And no way out. For the first time in history, somebody that owns a Bitcoin in Nicaragua or Venezuela uh, has a has an asset that will never devalue. You know, it's a, it's a permanent asset, and there's nobody's making more of it. So once you have that piece, nobody's taking it away. As a matter of fact, the more people that get into it makes the one that you get more valuable. That's never happened in history before, and you can't take it away from people. Yeah. You know, it's just a set of numbers, a set of words, yeah. and people can people can just uh, keep it in their brains, and there's no taking it away. So I don't think it, it can be stopped, and it's a worldwide phenomena for good. And now all these politicians, all these money managers, all these people that control the money and manipulate it and borrow, borrow it for nefarious purposes like wars and all kinds of controlling things, right? They can't do it anymore. Mm. And it's happening slowly but surely, just the way it's, it's supposed to do it. I don't know. There's, I feel something very spiritual is happening in the world, and Bitcoin's a big part of it. I think I think we're on the cusp of something very, very beautiful coming. I love it when, when you mentioned the word 
trustlessness, right? I, in, in the previous episode, I talked ab about this a lot too. It's, it's such a foreign concept for a lot of people. And I can't remember who, who said it, but we talked about the game of chess that like the chess, the rules of chess can also not be changed, right? You don't have to <laughs> trust the other person that they will follow the same rules of chess. Yeah. Or else we are not playing. We are not play, <laughs> playing chess, basically. But the, the entire concept of trustlessness is just foreign to to people because they have outsourced, you know, myself included, uh, so many elements of their life. And when I think about the word, word trustlessness and connect that back to the to the cult topic, right? Like you are basically forced to trust this leader that decides, well, whatever. You know, you can learn or do or not, do, well, well, have the mustache or or date someone outside <laughs> of the culture. Right? And, yeah. you, and you basically listen to it because you get enough value from what they give you. But along the way, you're, you're, you're I want to say like moving the goalpost of, I don't know, your, your influence or autonomy. I think autonomy is a, is a, is a better word, right? You know, Up until a point where you realize... Well, for you, it's when you got out of the cult, right? And I think it's for Bitcoiners when they get into Bitcoin, like, okay, this is this is enough. Like, I know I got some value from it, especially in the Western world, right? From fiat money. But but there is a point where, yeah, you just c cannot uh, b believe it anymore. So it's funny, but most people are very, are beautiful. Like, I, I remember even thinking the guy that was in, in charge of the cult that started it all. I really, I really don't know his motivation to this day. Like, I don't know if he really believed what he was saying uh, and, or he just wanted to make money and he, he was evil. I really don't know. I, I would love to sit down and talk to him. I guess he's passed by now, but I would have loved to sit down and, and pick his brain and see exactly what's in his head just for the psychology of it, you know? Yeah. But I, I think basically he was a good person, but just got carried away with his own ego and, I think that's the thing. That's just human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, first time we've got something that, that doesn't depend on, uh, on that. Yeah. You know, it's something that you don't have to trust anybody. It's, yeah. it's going to thrive regardless. And I don't know. I still um, contact uh, some of the people. This was, geez, 40 years, 30, 40 years ago, I was in it. And I, I met some of the people recently, actually, that were in it. They're beautiful people, just great people that have learned. They learned so much. And I don't think any one of them is sorry they were ever in it. Unlike some cults, like, yeah, I hate to, I hate to say Scientology because that's just, that's just to the extreme, but mm. things like that. That's, yeah. that's what people really think of when they, when they hear cult, but there's different, different levels, different severity of, of cults, but. I guess it's just human nature. People want to live their life and let somebody else make their decisions for them, which can be a bad, bad thing. It's it's yeah. like the banking system, right? Everybody trusts the bank. Like they don't want to self custody because they don't trust themselves. They're so used to trusting the government to do everything. And uh, like that, like the leader of the cult, I don't know if he set out to rip people off or, or be like the way he was. And I don't think the government set out to do that, but you know, I remember 30 years ago, they introduced seatbelt laws. Before, when I was a kid, they didn't even have seatbelts in cars. That's how old I am. But I remember they introduced the seatbelt law, and my two daughters were driving the car. Do your seatbelt up, Dad. And it used to piss me off because, look, wearing your seatbelt is a good, good idea. But I don't like the government telling me to do it, you know. And I used to tell them that, yeah, wearing seatbelts is a good idea. The government's right. People should wear their seatbelts. But when you give the government the power to tell you and fine you at, at um, eventually the point of a gun, when you give the government that power, they'll, they'll take it. And then the next time they'll take something a little bit more until you've, you've got them taking away people's bank accounts for supporting a legal protest. Yeah. You know, your, pro, your rights aren't taken away. they are taken away little by little by little. And that's what pissed me off about the seatbelt law, even though it was like this minor little thing, but I hated it at the time. I love freedom and Bitcoin is the ultimate freedom for, for worldwide. It's a, it's a yeah. hell of a phenomenon. I think the seatbelt example is nice because it could also have just been a suggestion. You know, if you wear a seatbelt, it's safer. 
but and 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 per perhaps there are arguments right that uh, you know people are less cr critically injured for example if they if they have an accident right but if you stick with the example you could say like well it's the best idea is to wear a seat belt but you you can still decide if you want to or not yeah that's the, that's the thing is like, when the government comes along they really believe that you know, you should wear a seatbelt because of the insurance, like your insurance rates will go up if more people die from accidents, things like that. There's always good reasons, right? Mm -hmm. But um, so that's why I think it creeps in. Socialism creeps in. And before you know it, you're living in a, in, not in a free country, little by little, right? And that's, that's what I like about Bitcoin because there's nobody changing the rules. They can't do it. Yeah, You know, they can't create more Bitcoin. They can't manipulate the system whatsoever. And everybody's checking on it all the time to make sure that happens. Like all yeah. these nodes are there. It's but uh, the incentives, incentives are aligned in a, in a good way, right? Like, you don't know, maybe the seatbelt manufacturers came up with the law, <laughs> right? I think that's the, <laughs> that, that's the point. If we stick to the example, you know, the fact that Bitcoin is just a set of rules that anyone can adopt and anyone who adopts it is incentivized to follow these rules so the network becomes stronger right but yeah there's so many of these different elements i think also uh, I, th I think you mentioned you know the kind of this innate human corruptibility that we all have even if we start out you know as a nice guy getting a group together to do meditations turns out to be a, a cult and and then he wants money from the people that 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 he helped um, I hate to say it takes away from um, it takes away the decisions from people. Exactly. But yeah. human nature is scary because I'll give you an example. I don't like to use my family too much, but uh, during COVID nineteen, right, there was a, a minister in Calgary that wanted to open his church, and and everybody, all his parishioners, wanted to go to the church and and worship. And this guy, I think it was Polish, some minister out there. So he, he opened up his parish. I mean, you could go to Costco, you could go to the big box stores, you could go to certain places uh, that the government deems okay, right? But you could, sorry, you couldn't go to church. So this guy decided to open his church and everybody was agreed to go there. You know, nobody was forced to go there. And the police showed up and arrested this guy and kept arresting him over, over the years. Uh, every time they, they were making up things, the Trudeau government were making up things to get this guy arrested. And the scary part was, um, I remember my sister talking about it, right? And she's, she's a sweetheart. She's my older sister, but everything the government does, I mean, you got to follow the rules. You know, you can't break the rules. And I remember talking to her and she brought up this priest and she said, you know, I don't, I don't wish ill will on anybody, but you know, if he got COVID, it would serve him right, talking about this minister, right? And it just reminded me of how Nazi Germany came to be. Like, you know, you keep telling people that the Jews are taking all the money, the Jews are this, the Jews are that, and people start to believe it. And pretty soon, you know, you got people turning them in, and if they get beaten in the street, they say, oh, it was terrible. But, you know, you really had it coming. I mean, it's terrible. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but... You know, he is stealing money. He's doing this because it's a hor it's a scary thing, human nature. You, you see this uh, group think, and that's what yeah, that's what the monetary system is now, and the governments. Uh, the more power you give them, the, the more they take. So, and so, how did you eventually discover Bitcoin, and what made you really get its value? Oh, what the, how did I discover it? Well, my, my name is really Satoshi, and uh, I came up with this white paper a few years ago, right? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I, I remember um, I was driving in uh, in Toronto in, in some job I had, I can't remember. And I knew I knew a little bit about Bitcoin, and it sounded like a good idea. But then I, I don't know how many years ago it was, but then I heard, that a bunch of Bitcoin was stolen. And I didn't know about cold storage or anything like that at the time. I just thought Bitcoin. So I'm thinking, okay, it's an online money. If people can just take it and steal it and hack into it, damn, it sounds like a good idea. But if it's so easy to hack, you know, I don't think it's going to work. And I didn't really give it a, I always thought about it in the back of my mind, but I thought, wow, what a great idea. But then um, 
I don't know. I'm kind of retired, so I'm watching all these YouTube videos in the last couple of years. And, yeah, so that's that's really educated. You really have to put the time in to understand just how profound this thing is. And uh, God bless all those other people. They're starting to, they're trying to start all these altcoins. And the most important thing about Bitcoin is there's no one controlling it. You know, it's it's a consensus. And that's the only one, only one you can say that about. So to me, it's the only one with real value. I mean, maybe these things will find a use case, all this, some of these altcoins. But basically, the real value of Bitcoin is the, the network effect. I even saw this astrophysicist, Giovanni something, talking about mm -hmm. yeah. the power law with Bitcoin. And he says it's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. You know, you know when astrophysicists are talking about it and explaining it, I'm trying to follow along what he's saying. I saw, I saw his video. It was, it was very extremely interesting. Yeah. yeah. But he's saying uh, it goes up and down over time, but in the long run, you can see it following a perfectly straight line up and to the right. Yeah. And it's this power law that aligns with the planets, the same way the planets work, the same way cities grow. Um, and he's he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, I talked, I, I have an episode with him. We talked for three hours while well, he, he talked for two hours and uh, 58 minutes, I think. <laughs> and I just asked some some beginner dumb dumb questions. But yeah, it's 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 fascinating. I think it's also... Once once you see this and you've opened your mind, it's just so interesting to find all these other dimensions of Bitcoin and also all these different people that that talk about Bitcoin from their point of view, right? But was was there anything? I mean, when you discovered Bitcoin, of course, you were you, you were older. You grew up in this Western country, you know, a prosperous Western country. Was it hard for you to get out of the the fiat money groupthink in a sense, or? Like, like, what helped you with that? That's a good question. I guess I was never really 100% into it. Like, I, I would make money, spend money. Years ago, I used to buy houses. I mean, I bought a house and made some good money on that. I invested in some other houses and, and made some money, sold it too soon. But when 2008 came along, I pretty much sold everything. I had uh, three or four houses, I think, and... I pretty much sold everything because the the way the financial system kind of collapsed, I thought housing was going to tank. And it should have. It should have actually tanked. And it did in the U.S., but it didn't in Canada because Canada pretty much bailed out the banks, which they shouldn't have. I mean, the free market would let these things even out, right? So I sold it and moved to Peru. <laughs> I said, I'm done with this. <laughs> Just get the yes. hell out of town. Yeah. But and I was so never, really, never really into it like, I can't stress enough what it, what I think Bitcoin is such a profound idea. Mm. Like people, people just don't understand how profound this is, how beautiful it is and how it's going to change the world for the better. It's a very spiritual thing to me. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a similar feeling. I think it's also hard to describe. I, I, I think one of the things that maybe it's still like an ongoing search, right? But you have this feeling and, and that's kind of what motivates you know, people in Bitcoin to, to just go further down the, you know, proverbial rabbit hole. But I also think it comes from, you know, if, if you get outside of this, like I, I like a group think in, in general, the concept, right? Like the fact that it exists, like if once you get out of this and you see this other reality, right? Like the, the opposite of something good can also be good or the opposite of something bad can also be bad. Right. But a lot of people just, just nowadays i think that the world is like good or bad like it's 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 all black and white i think in 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 essence it's probably all all, all gray right but once you get out of this group think you your mind is so much more open because you allow yourself to explore whatever comes on your path right and and it could be that sometimes something crosses your path where your initial reaction is like oh no i'm not going to touch that or think about that or that's stupid or you know whatever but yeah my book was yeah. called Family, Occult, and Trump. So I really wrote it about Trump before the uh, 2020 election. Mm -hmm. I was sure he was going to win. But just because I supported Trump, my family thought I was in another cult. <laughs> they thought, uh, oh, okay, <laughs> he's, in a, he's in another cult. Yeah. You know, but they don't understand. You don't look at the personality. You don't listen to what the news is saying about him. You, don't, you hate this guy and you don't even know why. 
You know, there's so much negative press about him, but people don't understand they're being led and they don't even understand it. So I looked at his policies, you know, less government, less spending, getting getting out of debt, um, a businessman, you know, doing doing what he should to grow the economy. Because with the with a good economy, I mean everybody benefits. Mm. But they thought they thought were sound boys in another cult. And it's just the opposite. They just don't understand. They're they're in this they listen to the mainstream media and uh, talking about um, about politics, and it's it's all. It, I hate to say misinformation, but it's you can't believe anything you hear any, anymore. Yeah, and um, yeah, there's just yeah, it's just it's crazy craziness. Well, in, in your book, you talk about the importance of introspection and self reflection as kind of a way to avoid being manipulated by by groupthink. Are there are there any yeah things you can share about that? Like how how do you engage with that to maintain kind of this independent thinking? Um, I don't know. I just think think of uh, going back. I have gut feelings, you know. Since um, I hate to say visions, but it just seems so good. So that's that's how I get get into this this mindset. Like, what's going to benefit the most people? And you can see that the debt is just growing and growing, and growing. There's no way out of it. So it, it's just common sense. Like there's, there's no way out. The only way out, as far as I can see now, is uh, adopting a Bitcoin standard. I think if the U.S. puts a uh, Bitcoin on their balance sheet and ties the U.S. dollar to Bitcoin, I think Trump is heading that direction. I think Trump is maybe, maybe a quarter of the way there. I saw Probably, his, his speech yeah. at the Bit Bitcoin conference, and and he said a few things, you know, lumping in cryptocurrency with Bitcoin. I don't know. I don't know if he gets it a hundred percent, but he's the kind of guy that that will uh, make necessary changes because he loves the country, no doubt. So yeah. he's he's gonna get it. So e eventually, I don't know if that, right? <laughs> eventually, yeah. I think when they see how how profound this problem is with the debt, I mean, we're talking. I think trillion a trillion dollars in three months added mm -hmm. to the U.S. debt. Yeah, it's insane. There's no way to pay it back, and nobody's going to want to buy that debt anymore. Like a lot of countries are going to the BRICS system. Look, Ron, we need Bitcoin. What else is there? Like, who's going to accept BRICS currency? Who's going to trust? It's the same thing. Like, I mean, we trusted the U.S. for fifty, sixty years, whatever it was since since the Second World War. And uh, when people went into, onto the U.S. standard, uh, 1971, uh, Nixon got us off the gold standard, which basically meant just printing money that was worthless. But people still bought into it, trusted it. Now we're in this massive debt. And now because of what um, he, the president did to Russia, got them off the Swiss system, nobody trusts the U.S. anymore, or less and less they trust it. So what's going to replace it? What's going to replace the U.S. dollar? The BRICS is yeah. going to really trust in the long term China, Russia. They're all out in the self interest. I mean, they're going to go on a gold standard, but so did the U.S. And nobody audited the U.S. Fort Knox, even when it was on the gold standard. It's life for corruption all over again. We yeah. need Bitcoin because we need a sound money. And that's going to change the world in many, many ways, profound ways. I, that's why I think it's such a beautiful thing. We're on the cusp of something really beautiful. Yeah, I think my my kind of like thesis or, or idea around this is uh, I, I I agree. You know, like Europe is forced to 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 follow the United States. I think still, you know, it's 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 as as a payback for for the Second World War in some sense. But it's going to become clear at a certain moment. I I don't know why it's not already clear yet, right? But this. The, the debt is never going to be repaid. I think what you mentioned, the debt, you know, a trillion every hundred days is not even including the unfunded liabilities, which in total is like over 200 trillion. So those are all things, you know, money that's promised on paper in laws, legislation, like all that stuff is, is already promised to people. And eventually they're not going to be able to pay it. You know, countries don't want to, it starts with the bricks. They don't want to buy the sovereign debt anymore. 
then Europe is going to be in a squeeze, right? Like, should we trust the US on their promise that they will actually be fiscally responsible? But right? from common, common sense, like, what's going to, what's step, going to step in? What's the only thing that well, can they step need, in? Yeah, yeah. So my point is they need the trustlessness because if, if all the monetary blocks fall apart and, and become like independent, they, the, the BRICS or just the US by itself would probably be the strongest, I think stronger than, than Europe, but, but they need the global trade. Like the world yeah. is, it, it, it's, it's already all so globalized. It would be devastating if there wasn't like a, a, well, a world currency that people could use to trade. And because as I agree with you, they're not going to be, uh, be trusting each other. They need the trustlessness of Bitcoin. And there's only one, one solution for that. Yeah, trustlessness, inflation free, you know, no more inflation, yeah, stable, which is yeah. which is stealing people's money two or three percent a year. Although everybody knows with half a brain knows it's way more than that. So yeah, it's yeah. There's so many things and you can you can divide it. You know, people is people are saying like gold is gold standard. It's got its flaws. Like we're in the digital age now. People have to wake up to this. It's we're not not going back. Yeah, we're in the digital age, and for the first time, people have put money on the internet. That's actual, the real thing. Like you can't. It's a, it's creating uh, money from energy. Yeah, you know, it's proof of work. That's another thing about it too. So many things. It's perfect money. You it's know? cool. Huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love it. So in your email, you mentioned to me, and I think that's also what what a lot of people responded to. That you said Bitcoin is the antithesis of a cult. And, you know, we talked a bit about the elements and, and, and your journey. I think some people could perceive, you know, certain things we say as cult ish, right? If we say, well, we are pro Bitcoin and the people who are pro fiat, even without understanding why they are pro fiat, you know, they just don't understand. <laughs> I think that's, it's that's absolutely the antithesis of, of, yeah. Uh, yeah. How would you I'm explain that? 100% because, um, there's no top down authority. There's nobody at the central bank. There's nobody at the federal reserve saying, Oh, we're going to set interest rates at this much. And people are just waiting with bated breath all over the world. The European central bank, Canada, is it going to raise interest rates? We're waiting for the governments to do all this stuff. Bitcoin just does it, does its thing. We're, we're, we're shifting into something completely different. And it's, it is really is the antithesis of, of a cult because. We're not, we're not worshiping anything. We're just, we're just seeing something that's absolutely real and can't be changed. And we're, we're pragmatic. You know, it's, it's yeah. just pragmatic. It's, it's the opposite of, of what a cult is, top down authority. You know, somebody else telling you what to do with your money, controlling your interest rates, you know, lending money to African countries, raping their, their natural resources, you know, for their own benefit. That's, that's all going to go away eventually. And mm. yeah, it's, it's the uh, opposite of a cult. So it's, it's interesting because when, you know, you talk about Bitcoin or like on, on Twitter or Reddit or whatever, like people, people use this as like this anti Bitcoin argument, but you know, Bitcoin is a cult because you all talk in the same way. And it's so funny <laughs> because I think, yeah, we talk in the same way because we understand the same thing and they're you know, if, confusing they're confusing cult with enthusiasm exactly and, uh, yeah yeah and that's that's the difference they don't know what a cult is then if they if they say that because you believe strongly in something i mean you could say okay i believe in god uh is that a cult you know i believe it a hundred percent it's, say, it's a, kind of a derogatory term to dismiss you know whatever substance uh, arguments uh, people people could use right they just kind of say like yes well, yeah. It's like saying, oh, conspiracy theory. It's a simple way to put people down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, a racist. You know, yeah. if you want to end an argument, just call them racist. So what, what it's like saying, uh, do you beat your wife? If you call somebody racist, you spend 20 minutes trying to just tell everybody why you're not racist and you're just digging your hole deeper just yeah. by them accusing you of that, right? So it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the opposite of a cult. Yeah, and I always think if a little argument or enthusiasm from someone, let's say like myself toward ab about Bitcoin towards someone who doesn't understand any of it. The fact that 
a lot of people default to this derogatory term to just, you know, put you in a certain spot, I think is an interesting signal too, because it means, I would say that something that I'm saying lands with you, right? And, and not, not even in a positive way, but as in a confronting way. So, so someone is triggered and puts on this derogatory, you know, you're in a cult thing just so they, Avoid actually thinking about uh, the the substance that is said, but yeah, I I like the idea of saying you know if Bitcoin was a cult, it would be like the only cult in the world <laughs> where its members would be invited to think for themselves and not trust other members. Yeah, and all over the world, little lights are coming on, click click. You know, like look at Michael Saylor; he didn't understand it at first, and Jamie Jamie Dimon, he was criticizing well, it. Jamie you know? Diamond, I think, is still debatable. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many people that are, that are into it now that weren't into it before, but they do the work and they understand how profound it is. You know, yeah, um, exactly. But, you know, what do we care? I mean, they call us a cult. They call us a cult. They just don't understand. Yeah, well, it, it, it's funny because you know the whole entire idea also of this podcast is not to tell people you should buy Bitcoin, right? I mean, like that's another argument. People say like, "Oh, you only talk positive about Bitcoin because you have Bitcoin," and then I always say, "Well, it would be very weird if I would be talking about Bitcoin and not have <laughs> any Bitcoin. Like that would be way worse, right?" So this entire <laughs> argument is super flawed. But yeah, it's just, it's just how it goes. I think, you know, what, what triggered me also in your message is like, you know, this is someone who can actually explain <laughs> what a cult is <laughs> and the fact that Bitcoin is the antithesis of a cult. I, I absolutely love it. I, I still want to challenge you and ask you, like, what's, wh what is, what is your, your future belief about Bitcoin or what's, the, what's the place in the world for Bitcoin? Well, like we said, I think we need a reserve currency. And I think Bitcoin's headed headed that way because there's nothing else like it. And I don't think there's anything else that could do what the U.S. dollar used to do. And the U.S. dollar is, is too, too far in debt and countries are starting to not buy their debt. And that's a, that's a big problem. Who's going to buy all the debt? Who's going to turn it over? So there's nothing else that can step in that is completely inflation inflation free. Sorry, what else did you ask? What did you want to well, you, 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 you said a few times, like, I feel that Bitcoin is so spiritual. It's so big. And I just wanted to challenge you to think about like what, yeah. in, in what kind, what kind of words would you use to, yeah, illustrate that, that feeling? Okay. Going back to the spiritual side of it, right? I think there's something very profound happening in the, in the world. Um, just things are happening the way they should. I've got a lot of faith in faith in what's happening, a lot of faith in God. Bitcoin is more like a spiritual movement. I mean, call it, call it a cult if you want. I mean, just by saying that, people are going to say, oh, he's in a cult again, right? <laughs> but that's, that's what I believe. <laughs> and look at, look at the assassination attempt on Trump. Just, just think about divine inter intervention for a minute, right? So, the FBI and the, and the Secret Service let this guy in. I don't care what they said. They sure weren't protecting him. They didn't care. There was all kinds of shady stuff going on. Uh, this guy got a shot off. For sure, they figured he was as good as dead. Uh, he just happened to turn his head at the right time, and it nicked his ear, right? And if you mm -hmm. think of, think of um, how things could have gone, if that bullet completely missed him, if it completely missed them, people would say, oh, no, there's never any bullet fired. He's never in real danger. Trump set it up. If it had been an inch this way, it would have killed him. But it just, it hit his ear. So there's kind of proof that it hit him, but it didn't really do any real damage, but it was enough to make him stand up and go like this, you know? So that bullet was guided to hit just enough of him to shock the world, let, him, let people know it's serious because it actually hit him, but not enough to do any real damage. So it allowed him to stand up and fight, 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 right? I don't know. There's too many, too many coincidences happening. So mm. I think it's some kind of divine intervention. Look, who knows, Brown, you know, who knows the mind of God, the mind of what, what this universe has in store. I, I don't profess to know anything about the mind of God or anything. I had, I had some visions sent to me by myself. 
I can't even talk about. I, th I think if somebody knew the mind of God, it would drive them mad. Our minds can't handle handle the, the wonder of whatever. Yeah. So you mentioned before, like the, 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 the positive emotional and spiritual growth that you gained from the, from the time in the cult, despite also the eventual negative aspects of, of being part of it. Right. How do you think this entire experience has shaped your worldview today? I guess it just reinforced. I love freedom, bro. Everything to me is freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of mind, freedom of movement. You know, I like to feel fresh air in my lungs. I, I love nature. I just, I just, I just want that for the whole world. And I saw the oppression in the cult and I always knew I'd get out of it someday, but I want to learn. My prayers were answered because um, I learned about human nature, uh, group think, herd mentality. It was very eye opening. I saw it in my, my family. I saw it in, you know, you read about it in Nazi Germany. How did that happen? How did people fall for that? It's very easy, you know, and that's how it, how it changed me that being in the cult, just seeing the, the group mentality. And so when, when I saw your podcast and, and the guy, and you asked the guy, you think it's a cult? And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's anything, but it's, it's just <laughs> the, the opposite. So I, I had the right. Love that. So. Well, I want to ask you my last question and, and maybe part of the answer to that question was already in, in the previous answer, but I ask everyone the same question in the end. And that is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? I guess uh, just go on. It, it's just my belief that things uh, that we live in a world that's not real. I mean, the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2022 was won by three researchers that prove that what we see isn't real. Yeah, so, you know, just my, my belief in God is, is unshakable. And I think we're being guided somehow. I don't think whatever God is wants to see us go down in flames. Like, like it seems like we're headed sometimes. And I like to watch videos of people that have um, died and come back, like life after death and what they I have to say. I knew you were going to say this. It's okay. incredible. Yes. You know, they all say if this isn't real. And I remember listening to the lady on, on the radio uh, years ago. She was talking about her life after death experience. She had three kids. I can't remember three or four kids and a loving husband. And she died. And uh, she told the guy on the radio, if you had told me that I wouldn't want to come back to my kids and my husband and stay where I was, I wouldn't have believed it. And that's exactly how she felt. She said, what, what we're seeing, we don't know what love is, you know. And I felt that with my mother, with that wow. message I got from my mother that I can't even describe to you. Like, That's amazing. They say that the beings, the beings on the other side communicate without saying anything. Like you know everything about them and all their thoughts without opening their mouth, feel everything they feel. And that's exactly what I felt with my mother. It was, I'd never felt anybody in this world so completely free and happy as I did that day. And I can't describe it. Just as me off. <laughs> you know? I, I, I feel what you're saying. So I'm I'm very grateful for you sharing this and I'm very grateful for your time and I'm super happy that we finally got the chance to talk and, and thanks so much for sharing your experience and I reach, really, really appreciate it. So thank oh, you. Oh Graham, I love your work. I, I love your podcast. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.